It would take reaching out and claiming for her, claiming for her own what had been put into the garden that she and Adam were to tend. And after all, if you're going to tend to the garden, you're going to care for the garden, you have to take care of the trees, you must need to know something about the trees. You need to know the texture of the fruit. You've got to see what it feels like. You might want to see what it smells like. You might want to see what it tastes like. Because that's your job is to care for it. So she reached out her hand. And she took the fruit. Because it was a delight to her eyes. What was Jesus' reaction to the same temptation? Come and see. Jesus, in Luke 4, 8, said, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, what Jesus was shown, remember, Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. What he was shown was real and desirable to look upon. Most importantly, it was within his grasp. It would simply take out and reaching out, reaching out to claim it for his own because that's what he came to do. So Satan was saying, here it is. This is what you came for, isn't it? Why don't you just take it now? Why suffer when you can be handed the scepter of rule over those you came for, over those you love, over those you came to save? Why suffer? Jesus said no. Instead, he quoted a scripture of deliverance. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. This time, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 12 to 15. Take care that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Interesting. Same scenario of deliverance. Out of the house of slavery. The Lord your God, shall, you shall fear him. You shall, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. Do not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who are around you, because the Lord your God who is present with you is a jealous God. The anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he would destroy you from the face of the earth. So it's a worship. The Lord your God only, and him is, it is the one that you serve. In our fighting, our desires of our eyes. And again, brethren, the things that we see, not necessarily uh, uh, sinful by nature. So the filter of obedience and sacrifice, unless it's put in place, we can end up in trouble. In our fighting, these desires of our eyes, our eyes, and oftentimes, brethren, these desires will lead to slavery and idolatry. Not a good end result. Do we not forget the Lord who brought us up out of the house of slavery? Haven't you been delivered? See, that's what Jesus was looking at. That's what Jesus was seeing. To follow any of the other gods of the people around us. Have we forgotten that we've been delivered from following these other gods that were false? Do we not realize the Lord our God is present with us? Do we not realize the anger of the Lord? We were bought with a price. If we were to betray that, that purchase, the Lord is not happy. Revelation 3.17 said, For you say, I am rich, and I have prospered. The lust or desire of the eyes can lead us to believe we have prospered. Because it looks that way. Perhaps it is not as we think. In Revelation 3.18 it says, You need salve to anoint your eyes so you can see what's really happening. In our lives of Christian sacrifice, if our eyes are not anointed, we won't see the truth. This ought to be evident, because we see the effects of a world that's blinded by sin. They're blinded. They don't have a choice. They can't will themselves out of sin. There is no hope except for the plan, and that the hope time for them is not yet. But for us, it has been put in place. But unless we maintain an anointed view of life, it's not pretty. Salve to anoint your eyes. The pride of life. Back to the Luke 4 account. And he led him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, 
Cast yourself down from hence. For it is written. See, Satan's getting the hang of Jesus' thinking here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee to guard thee, and on their hands they shall bear thee up, lest haply thou dash thy foot against a stone. The pride of life. In Genesis 3.6, with Eve, the pride of life was expressed in that the tree was desired to make one wise. Now, this tree in the garden, in its proper context, would have made Eve wise. But she was in no way ready to wield the power that it held. For God had not yet handed over to Adam and his mate full dominion over the earth. Thus, receiving of the fruit was not only premature, but it was from the wrong source. And therefore, it was folly and not wisdom at all. Yet Eve placed herself above the commands of God and followed her naked desire to be elevated. What was Jesus' reaction to the same temptation? Come and see. In Luke 4.12, Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, You will not make trial of the Lord your God. See, in the proper context, Jesus had the power of angelic protection. He had but to ask, and his father would have delivered him. But not here. Not now. Jesus was in no way willing to wield such power at the suggestion of such an evil one and in the pursuit of such foolishness. This was not the Father's path, and it would not become his path. Instead, Jesus quoted, you got it, scriptures of deliverance. See, he chose to obey and sacrifice. And again, it goes back to the same deliverance. It's quoted in Deuteronomy 6, 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. And that's taken from Exodus 17, 2. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? So Jesus' reaction in all three instances was to go back to the same general events. It was God's deliverance from sin. And our fight against the pride of life. We must learn to realize what Jesus already knew. There is but one way, and that way is the way of righteousness and humility. Brother, make no mistake. Just because you live righteously doesn't mean you live sacrificially. Just because you live humbly doesn't mean you live sacrificially. And just because you live righteously and humbly doesn't mean you live sacrificially. Those are building blocks to get to a life of sacrifice. But do not confuse them. Why do we put our God to the test by stepping outside the bounds of our own enlightenment our desire, perhaps, to be noticed, our desire to appear wise, to appear mighty, these things are not of God at all. They're folly. Now, witness, wisdom, and might, they are of God. 